I ended up with an invitation to move to Kerrville by Rod Kennedy, the founder of the Kerrville Folk Festival. And he said, um, you've been coming to this festival every year, because I did. He said, why don't you move down here and help raise money for my Songwriters Foundation, because you have a PhD with a focus in writing. I loaded up my kids and my horses, and we moved to Kerrville. The Texas Hill Country is one of the most beautiful places on earth. In this podcast, recent Hill Country resident Tom Fox visits with the people and organizations that make this one of the most unique areas of Texas. Join Tom as he explores the people, places, and their activities of the Texas Hill Country. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Kathleen Hudson. Kathleen is with uh, Shriner University, and we're going to visit with uh, her about her work at Shriner over the years, some of the uh, books she's written. Uh, She has a fascinating uh, musical story. I found out she loves Jimmy Rogers. So you're the first person I've met that loves Jimmy Rogers. And we're certainly going to talk about that. But first, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me. Well, thank you for coming to my office at Shriner. (laughs) This is fun. So Kathleen, where did you grow up and where did you go to college? I spent most of my youth in Fort Worth, Texas, and I went to TCU, and I had a dream of barrel racing in the Fort Worth Rodeo someday, and so I did. And I raised children and taught high school, and I went back to school for a PhD And at the time, I was also going through a divorce, and I ended up with an invitation to move to Kerrville by Rod Kennedy, the founder of the Kerrville Folk Festival. And he said, "Um, you've been coming to this festival every year, because I did. He said, why don't you move down here and help raise money for my Songwriters Foundation, because you have a PhD with a focus in writing. So without much more research into what a development director does. <laughs> I loaded up my kids and my horses and we moved to Kerrville. And when was that? That was in 1984. And when did you start with Shriner University? Well, it became very clear that that was not going to be my um, career to raise children, uh, raising money for a nonprofit. So um, an opening at Shriner occurred and I had the PhD with the focus on rhetoric and composition as well as some literature. But um, the opening came in August and I stepped in. So that was uh, a long time ago. Pretty exciting, yeah. And I'm still here. And you're still here. Are you the uh, oldest tenured professor, or excuse me, most senior tenured professor at Triner? I'm not. Uh, Darlene Bannister, the registrar has been here longer than I have, and she came in as a history professor. But I have her by age, so I am the oldest professor. (laughs) We looked around at a faculty dinner the other night, and I thought, oh, all these people came after me, except Darlene. So, So, yeah. So what was was Shriner like in the mid-'80s? Well... I came in as the only female in the English department. There was the history of being a military institute. I believe it had only been a four-year college. They were like graduating their first class when I came in. So the military atmosphere, the dusty quad out there where they had marched, which is now a beautiful garden, um, that was all around me. And I was bright-eyed and excited. This was my first teaching job at a college, and I just jumped right in. I love teaching. I've been doing it since 1968, and it's been a passion that just lights me up. And even now when people look at me and say, hey, when are you going to (laughs) retire? I say, you know, as long as I get up and go do something that really feeds my soul, I mean, I'm actually excited right now, today, about the two classes I have today. So, What are you teaching uh, this term? Well, this term I'm teaching freshman composition, and I'm teaching creative writing. So what is the um, 
or uh, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier you uh, have one of your degrees is in writing, uh, but you're also uh, a studier of songwriters, a songwriter, and a song singer. What led to all of that? Well, when I was working on my Ph.D. with the focus in writing, I started reading interviews with writers. And they ended up allowing me to do a dissertation, which was 350 pages of what writers say about writing. And because I was a fan of the Kerrville Folk Festival, Rod Kennedy helped me set up interviews, and I interviewed Peter Yarrow of Peter, Paul, and Mary and included that in my dissertation. So it was kind of a quick step from the Ph.D. and the scholarship um, to songwriters. And my first book, which came out in 2001, was a collection of interviews with songwriters. And these were interviews that were not conducted by journalists. So they had a flavor of what's the role of writing in your life. And I, I talked to Robert Earl Keene, Towns Van Zandt, Guy Clark. Um, I had quite a collection of interviews. And then when that book came out, I looked and realized that it was loaded with men. And I thought, whoa, how, how did I do that? And so I decided to focus on the women. And my second book was Voices of Women in Texas Music. And that came out in 2007. Now, all the time I'm inviting these people to my classroom, I'm teaching writing, have them talk about writing. So right now, I have a series of songwriters coming into my 2.30 class. I work with Bill Muse, who has a new songkeepers program. So he brings them to work with his students, and we collaborate so they come to my creative writing class. And I tell my class, this is another way of learning. I can tell you what I know from research. You will not become a better writer till you write. And to hear a professional writer talk about their life can be very empowering. And uh, so I've done that in my classes. So that's how I weave together. They're not separate at all. Um, when I moved to town in 84 in August, down at the depot, which is now Rails, yes, there was a tribute to Jimmy Rogers. And I thought, who's that? What's this? And at the time, Rod Kennedy was doing it. It had been done by the Historical Society and a man who's no longer with us, Mike Walker, and his then wife, Cat Walker, brought the idea to town from Houston. But Rod did it, and I was down there, and I didn't know who Jimmy Rogers was, but I loved the people who were gathering. And so the next year, Rod said, I'm not doing that. Like, there's no money in it, and it's a lot of work. And so I raised my hand as a volunteer, and I said, I'll do it. And I've been doing it ever since, every September. So for those <laughs> uh, few who are listening to this podcast who may not know Jimmy Rogers, could you tell us who Jimmy Rogers was Well, and, he's and really been, his legacy to American music? Well, he's been labeled uh, the father of country music. He was inducted into the Country Music Hall of, uh, Hall of Fame. He was first inducted. And those labels come later in life, of course. But um, his story is fascinating. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis, which was a death sentence, and then he went into show business. <laughs> America's singing brakeman, right? He's riding trains around. So he goes into show business. He opens the Majestic Theater in 1929. He builds a house in Kerrville. You might remember the line, they put me off in Texas, a state I dearly love. So he was not from Texas. Um, he was from Mississippi. But they put me off in Texas. So the exciting thing for this community is from 1929 to 1931, he lived in Kerrville. He built Blue Yodler's Paradise here. He came here because of his tuberculosis. This was a TB center at the time. And then in 31, he went over to San Antonio and got a duplex, and he knew his life was very short. <laughs> and he started deliberately going to New York to record. Um, I interviewed his daughter once, and he deliberately recorded so that his wife and daughter would have money. I'm, I'm doing this for them. So, I don't know, 108 songs, I think, in total. But 
I worked with Jimmy Rogers' grandson. He took me to San Antonio to meet his daughter, and I became involved with the family. And right now, I'm planning a community tribute to Jimmy Rogers at the uh, new venue, Cafe at the Ridge. And um, I haven't put together the details yet, but it'll either be September 10th or 11th, and it'll be very close to his birthday, September 8th, and more on that to come. Well, uh, that'll be great, and I'm certainly uh, looking forward to that. Um, could you tell us, uh, I, I've visited with several several of your colleagues here at Shriner, and Shriner's a very, in my mind, unique university, but I wanted to focus on the students of Shriner. And is there a typical Shriner student, and uh, or is it really uh, just a mishmash of, of different people from literally – across the state and, and across this nation uh, that, that are drawn to Kerrville and the beauty of this place? One of the things that we really have going for us here at Shriner is our size. I started here when there were 600 students. Now we're up to about 1,200. But the faculty-student relationship is what the students talk about and it's what I talk about as a faculty member. And I just, I get to know my students well. So we do have a lot of students here who are first generation, but that's not all of them. We have students here who deliberately want the individual one-on-one attention. We have a phenomenal LSS program, Learning Support Center. So we have a percentage of students that we take care of who may learn in a different way. And um, my joy, and and of course, we're a Hispanic serving institution, which means over 25% uh, of our students do have Hispanic heritage. So you use the word mishmash. <laughs> we, we do have a lot of different types. There's, there's not one type of student who comes here. I love the variety in my classrooms. I love the freedom I've had to use my research in the classroom and to shape my classes so that um, we address all the individual ways of learning. And Schreiner is very clear that having a bunch of professors lecturing in a classroom it's not the only way to learn and i'm kind of on the forefront of um, using an experience and experimenting with many ways of learning could uh, you just recently published uh, i think you said your third book yeah. could you tell us a little bit about that well after the second book i said no more uh, because I'm a collector and taking a tape recorder and running out and interviewing someone and then figuring out how to organize them and transcribe them and edit them um, is difficult. But my third book is a collection of interviews with Mexican-American voices. And I love Mexico. I have a place in San Miguel de Allende. I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I just love the connection with Texas. I love Flaco, the Tex Maniacs, Santiago. Um, I've brought them all to Shriner. And so it just seemed like the perfect book to complete a trilogy. Now, the first two were with University of Texas Press. This one is with A&M. And it just came out about two weeks ago. And my first book fair is going to be at the Twig Bookstore in the Pearl Brewery in San Antonio. And from 10.30 to 12, the authors who have books at the Twig are all gonna be sitting out, you know, come come meet the author. So I'm excited about that. Uh, you've got a uh, writer's conference coming up. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, in line with honoring Mexican-American voices, we're um, bringing in a young man from San Antonio named Rooster Martinez. And he's got some phenomenal uh, uh, films on YouTube. And the one I've shown my students is when he is talking to a group of students and he tells them to write, share, and be heard. So we've been practicing that in my classes. Tomorrow's uh, workshop is from three to five. There's no charge. Um, We've had 
a long history of this workshop in April. And I've had Sandra Cisneros, I've had James McMurtry, I've had the well-known and the unknown. And Rooster is just a real force in the literature scene in San Antonio. Rooster Martinez. So we'll have a workshop from 3 to 5 in the Junkins Center, which is in the middle of campus. And then at 7, we'll have a spoken word coffee house, and he'll be the featured performer. And he performs what's called slam poetry. And I used to be kind of put off by that word slam. But what it really is is a poem that is performed and lives in the moment. And there's slam poetry contests, and audiences judge them with numbers. And it really has to do with the power of poetry in the moment. So we'll have a performance tomorrow night, Wednesday night. We'll have an open mic. We'll have student readings. And I did start this series. <laughs> I received a creative teaching grant oh, over 20 years ago and decided to use it on bringing writers to campus. So well, you should join us. I plan to. That'd be so great. Uh, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering if anyone wanted more information on yourself or any of the topics we've touched on, what would be the best way to find out? Well, I have a email address, lowercase Kathleen Hudson 123 at hotmail.com. And I'm really good with texting and phone calls, and I'm going to give my phone number here. 830-377-3186. So, for information, or you want to talk to me about the September tribute to Jimmy Rogers, <laughs> we could put together a team of volunteers on that one. And I'm I'm really look forward to talking to you again sometime. Well, that was what I was going to ask, so uh, I hope we can continue <laughs> this conversation. Well, you know, our degrees are very similar. Rhetoric and law in Greece they were one and the same, uh, the rhetors, and then the branched off into rhetoric and law. I How we that. use language. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been a ton of fun. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you very much. This is Tom Fox. I love telling stories, and the Hill Country Podcast is designed to do just that. If you have a story you'd like to tell, I'd love to sit down and visit with you. Please contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. And I'll sit down and visit with you for an episode of the Hill Country Podcast. The Hill Country Podcast is designed to tell the people, places, and things that make this the most unique part of Texas. The Hill Country Podcast is a production of Compliance Podcast Network.